The economic demise of the Soviet Union, online for teachers, is designed to introduce the economic way of thinking using the tools of economic analysis in the context of the 70 plus year history of the Soviet Union for background, illustration, and examples. The goal of the FTE is to teach economic reasoning, that is, an active analysis-based pedagogy that empowers students with the critical thinking skills necessary to make sense of the world around them. In this course, we'll start with the most basic of those critical thinking tools, and we'll use them to answer an historical question. Why did the Soviet Union fall apart in 1991? The FTE's five economic reasoning propositions capture the essence of this critical thinking pedagogy, and they form the framework for all the lessons and classroom activities on the Foundation's website, and for all our teacher and student programs. Economic reasoning is universally applicable, regardless of topic or context. It empowers students to understand and explain human behavior. A much more valuable skill, we believe, than just mastering vocabulary or drawing graphs and models that characterizes a more traditional approach to economic education. Armed with economic reasoning tools, citizens can do economics, using critical analysis to evaluate their own choices and to understand the choices of others in the increasing number of communities they participate in every day. And, as we'll see in the economic demise of the Soviet Union, historians are also well served by the economic way of thinking. It adds one more lens to their multiple perspective glasses and lets them see the people and the choices that are the genesis of historical forces. Here again are the five economic reasoning propositions. We'll look at each one in detail in a minute. But notice that they focus on human behavior how we choose, and what shapes our choices. They don't specify passive definitions of vocabulary terms, and they don't require memorization of concepts or manipulation of graphs and complex mathematical formulas. While those things can be important tools, particularly to the academic, they're neither necessary nor sufficient for mastering the economic way of thinking, a skill we hope students will internalize and maintain even if their command of particular vocabulary or their ability to define terms eventually fades. As an entry-level course, the economic demise of the Soviet Union focuses on the first three reasoning propositions, choice, cost, and incentives. These are the foundational tools of economic analysis. Proposition 1 reminds us emphatically that economics is a social science. Sharing with disciplines like psychology, sociology, history, and political science, the goal of understanding people and the choices they make. Now, note that Proposition 1 focuses on choice, the necessity that arises from scarcity rather than on the condition of scarcity itself, and it focuses on how we choose. The application to our current topic is that the Soviet Union didn't just happen and then 70 years later just end. It arose and it fell, not as a consequence of amorphous historical forces out there, but as a result of the interactions and cumulative effects of millions of people's individual choices. Reasoning proposition number two reminds us that there's no such thing as a free lunch and that choices have consequences. The decisions that shaped the Soviet Union, just like the choices that shaped our country, were made by people with more or less power, some simply trying to better themselves and their families within the scope of their limited alternatives, an unknown future, and the cost they paid for every benefit, and others pursuers of vision or power or both, who were positioned to shape alternatives and pursued benefits by imposing the burden of cost on other people. The third piece of the human decision-making puzzle is incentives, the rewards and punishments that weight the cost-benefit equation 
and encourage people to choose one alternative over another. To paraphrase economic reasoning proposition number three, incentives matter. The history of particularly the latter decades of the Soviet Union is rife with stories of behavior we find strange, from people getting into lines before asking what the line was for, to factories that continued to churn out things no one wanted and pile them up in warehouses. Economic reasoning proposition number three reminds us that before dismissing those people as somehow different from the rest of us, it might be a good idea to ask what incentives they faced. Economic reasoning propositions four and five, which you see on the screen now, figure less prominently in the demise of the Soviet Union lessons, although they certainly apply. In this course, we'll prepare you for courses like Is Capitalism Good for the Poor? and the Economics of Disasters that employ institutional analysis throughout. And as for economic reasoning proposition number five, we'll certainly use historical evidence to support our analysis of the fall of the Soviet Union. However, statistical and data analysis play a bigger role in Is Capitalism Good for the Poor and the Economics of Disasters than they do in the Soviet Union materials. There are six lessons in the economic demise of the Soviet Union. They can comprise a unit of instruction and be taught sequentially. However, the lessons can also stand alone to be inserted individually into a variety of curricula. Each lesson consists of two components, a teacher background content and a classroom activity. The background is presented as a loosely organized outline and it's intended to be a teacher resource rather than a prescription or even a, a lecture guide. The purpose is to provide an easily accessible source of explanations and examples that can be dropped into such diverse social studies curricula as economic geography or revolutions, for example, as easily as they can be incorporated into world history or economics courses. The chronology of Russian history is woven throughout the lessons. And in keeping with the keep it simple rule, each lesson develops one, only one, tool of economic reasoning. The organization of the lessons is also intended to emphasize that economics is about people, not money, not math, not graphs or equations. So, to that end, each lesson focuses on a different group of people in Soviet society, starting at the top with the rulers in Lesson 1 and progressing down to the bureaucrats, the factory managers, the farmers, and ultimately to the ordinary citizens. Lesson 6 is a little bit different. We might have entitled it something like, They aren't all that different, or We do it too because it looks at places in our country where Soviet-like behavior dominates, bringing home the point of economic reasoning proposition number three, that incentives change behavior in predictable ways. Incentives matter to people all over the world, and we find that when the incentives are the same, the behavior is the same, regardless of where people live or the name we give their economic system. The economic demise of the Soviet Union teaches us to ask, what incentives are people responding to when we look at different economic institutions? One of the lessons we learn in looking at the Soviet Union is that incentives in centrally planned economies are usually much different than those in market economies like our own. Usually, that is, because when our institutions create the same incentives that operated in the Soviet Union, we see the same types of choices and behaviors. I want to emphasize that focusing on an economic perspective should not diminish the importance of the historical content, nor of larger historical issues and questions. For years, scholars predicted that a flawed economy and an unsustainable political structure would eventually undermine the Soviet Union. If you're as old as I am, you might have taught that yourself, or even learned it in your high school and college courses. And yet, when the Soviet Union finally did fall, there was a general sense of surprise, 
that was it? It's over? And despite all the predictions, it wasn't just an economic collapse. After all, the economy had been weak since the beginning, and there were no overt signs that it was appreciably more so in 1991. In fact, the head of Gorbachev's economic advisors told New Yorker editor David Remnick that she felt they had at least 10 to 15 years before the economic situation would have deteriorated to the point of collapse. So, pursuing these two questions, why 1991 and what role did the economy play, we've adopted the historian's search for multiple causes. We're struck with the importance of people's buy-in to the Soviet system, and we're led to propose that the Soviet Union fell only when the people finally gave up their belief that communism would provide them better lives. Consider this analogy. Visualize the Soviet Union as resting on a three-legged stool, each leg representing one of the institutional structures supporting the system. The first leg is the political legal leg, perhaps the part that we're most familiar with, the totalitarian rule of man, the Politburo, the strong military, the frightening KGB. Certainly, this is the aspect of the Soviet Union that receives the most attention in our textbooks, and undeniably, it was always the strongest leg of the stool. The second, or moral cultural leg of the Soviet stool, is that elusive but essential element of support. Any system of governance requires its citizens' buy-in, which, of course, can have a variety of sources, including not only a shared vision, but also, at the other end of the spectrum, a sense of fear. In the case of the Soviet Union, the moral cultural leg was a combination of belief in communism and fear of the political legal structures. The third leg of our model is the economic leg, which was certainly weak from the very beginning of the Soviet Union in 1917, a condition the communists didn't create, but one that they never managed to successfully change. The cracks in this leg persisted and got bigger over time. But note how the stool analogy suggests that we can't use the economy to explain the demise on its own. A three-legged stool can continue to stand and function with weakness in one leg as long as the other two are strong. And for 70 years in the USSR, they were strong enough. Until weakness developed in another leg, the stool may have wobbled, but it stood. So we propose that it was the crumbling of the moral cultural leg, the buy-in to the system in the latter decades of the 20th century, that finally brought down the Soviet Union. As we develop our admittedly general overview of Soviet history, we'll focus then on these two legs of the Soviet system, the economy and the citizens' buy-in to that system. We make no claims to be Soviet historians, and certainly many of you will know much more about the events and personalities mentioned in these lessons. But we hope that by the end of this course, you too will be struck by the interplay between the economic and moral cultural institutions in Soviet society, and by both the stubborn persistence of a seriously flawed economic system and its final almost anticlimactic disintegration. So that ends our introduction, and let me just say welcome again to the Economic Demise of the Soviet Union online for teachers. Please check the introductory lessons and assignments, and we'll see you here soon for Lecture 1 on A Journey of Choices.